Aloha, I'm Christy Chadwick. I am a teacher of the deaf. I have a master's in deaf education from Washington University School of Medicine. I live on Maui and I run an organization called Hawaii Hears. Hawaii Hears just recently formed a nonprofit arm called Deaf Education Awareness Foundation. And we are devoted to bringing awareness and advocacy for children who are deaf or hard of hearing and their families. What this means is that we provide services to families on a sliding scale, regardless of their income or ability to pay. We provide regular, consistent services so that the babies and all the way up into school aged children can learn to communicate with their families. They can learn how to read and be able to be successful in academics. So if you have a child who is deaf or hard of hearing, or you know someone who does, please feel free to reach out by email at info at hawaiihears.com or visit the website www.hawaiihears.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at Hawaii Hears, or join uh, the Facebook group at Hawaii Hears, or like our pages, Hawaii Hears, and also Deaf Education Awareness Foundation. And a few weeks ago, I got together with my classmates via Zoom from Washington University School of Medicine, where we graduated from the Program of Audiology and Communication Sciences, or PACS, like we like to call it, P-A-C-S, PACS. We haven't seen each other, really, for about four years, with the exception of a couple of us who work together and um, have maybe lived in the same town, so they've seen each other a little more often. But nonetheless, it's been four years since graduation, and I wanted to catch up with all of them to see where they've been working, what they've been doing with their skills as a deaf educator, and what they could say about the field now that we've all been in the field in various states, um, in various ways, whether it's an elementary school, early intervention, um, maybe even um, middle school or high school. I hope you get um, a few things out of this so that you can learn more Uh, about the perspective of teaching children who are deaf or hard of hearing and what it's like to be a teacher of the deaf who specializes in listening and spoken language. And also learn about what's going on in the field of deaf education around the United States um, and just the various points of view that we have um, and how they align and, and what we've noticed that are similar and different within our our areas of where we have ended up working. So I hope you enjoy and uh, leave a comment below if you have any questions or like to reach out to learn more about how you can help your child who is deaf or hard of hearing learn to listen and talk. All right. Hi, ladies. So nice to see all of you. So this is our first time getting back together in four years. We graduated from Wash U all together in 2016. And now, finally, we get to talk about our experiences in the field of deaf education, what we've been doing for four years, how we've been providing for families who have babies who are deaf, um, and all age ranges. We've all worked in various different um, aspects within private schools, public schools, with birth to three all the way up to 21. So first, I just want to kind of go around and have you all introduce yourselves um, individually. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing for the last four years, um, any experience that you've had in one state and versus another state and where you are currently and um, any age range that you've worked with and um, tell us a little bit about how you're doing now. Okay, so Let's start with Ainsley. All right, my name's Ainsley Hill. Um, I'm originally from Mississippi. And after I graduated from WashU in 2016, um, I was called to move to Colorado, um, just in Greeley, Colorado, which is um, near Denver. 
Uh, they were recruiting me because they needed a listening and spoken language teacher who taught deaf and hard of hearing students um, to come into their total communication program. With total communication, that's any mode of communication. So one of the modes is listening and spoken language and they thought, found that very interesting and they needed one because they had uh, students with cochlear implants and hearing aids and um, students that did not sign. So that was a big hurdle for them to find a teacher that had the experience to work with those types of students. So um, here I come from St. Louis after graduation and moved to Colorado um, thinking, you know, I can do this, I can do this. And so I go into this school and it turns out I'm the expert. Um, I'm the one that's supposed to know everything, how to um, teach these students. And I'm the only one who is listening in spoken language. So anyways, so I get to this school and I'm the expert. Um, and the, they look to me like, okay, what do we do? And so that was a little scary going into it, but I really did enjoy it. Um, I did have to use sign at times because my, my students were blended together with communication. I was working with interpreters all the time. Um, I had one at my fingertips if I needed it, uh, but anytime that I had those listening and spoken language kids, I had the opportunity to practice those language strategies that we, we, we were taught in grad school. So after about a year and a half in Colorado, my husband and I realized, um, one, um, I really wasn't as happy at my job that I initially was. There were some administration changes. And so I feel like I was having to go through the whole, um, here's what I do. This is why I do it. And here's, I'm, I'm knowledgeable in this because, and I kept having to fight for um, the students. I was having to advocate for them to show them this is what they need. Um, and after about a year and a half of fighting, I felt kind of tired of it. Um, I also missed my family. I was across the country and um, I wanted to move back to the South. We were about to have kids and um, that was something that we really wanted. So I <laughs> reached out to a colleague of mine um, that I graduated with, which is Amy Owens. So you'll hear her story soon. Um, she was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I said, oh, this is a long shot. I'm going to text her. So one night I'm sitting there, I'm really upset about work, and I sit there and I text her, and I said, hey, you wouldn't happen to have a job opportunity in Memphis, Tennessee, and she said, actually, we need two teachers. So um, I reached out to her principal the very next week, and they were like, well, when can you start? And so I started mid-year in Memphis, Tennessee. So here I go, move across country again. Um, cause as we know, these teachers are needed everywhere. Um, and so I go across country to Memphis, Tennessee, and my, um, program is actually listening in spoken language. Um, and just like the other program, it was housed in a public setting, public school setting. Um, so we are in an elementary school, uh, but our classrooms are just in the midst of everybody, um, in that elementary school. So I work now, I work with, um, kids who are in fourth and fifth grade. I love the older kids. Um, that's always been my passion. Um, I'm never, I mean, I love the babies. I love pre-K students, but I've always had a passion to like discussion and um, teaching academics and then also like broadening that, that language for them. And so that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing listening spoken language and doing exactly what I was set out to do. Um, yes, I am still advocating for these students, and I've come to find that this is happening all over the United States. I mean, we are the experts, and so we have to be knowledgeable about what we do, and often I find myself in IEP meetings, and um, I'll just word vomit information that I didn't even know that I knew, but it was from grad school, because <laughs> I, I knew it, because I, I listened in that lecture that day, and so we know more than we think we do. Um, and so that's been a, a kind of a challenge and experience for me to actually, you know what, step up and own it, that you know what you're talking about. And so um, 
anyways, that was probably a ramble, but that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm actually really enjoying it. Um, I'm even enjoying the virtual learning right now. I have about 12 out of 15 students that I have on my caseload that are joining me every day for class. And it's, it's been fun. Wow. That was perfect. Thank you, Ainsley. I appreciate you sharing all of your story and um, your passion for it comes through. And I totally agree with you about how we think we don't know and we may not feel like the experts when we're going into the field. But as soon as some question comes up or a family needs something or another teacher has um, some question about how to support their child in the classroom, word vomit just comes out and we end up knowing what, what to say. So right. very My grateful for our education. My has been very supportive at this location. Um, they were supportive the other location. It was just, um, I felt like I had to fight more to talk mm -hmm. about these students and what they need. Um, and so at this location, um, he is super supportive and he'll like look at us sometimes like, oh, that's interesting. Like he He's learning new information every day yeah. about these students. So I think um, I keep trying to call her Miss Owen because in a professional <laughs> setting, I can call her. But Amy and I have to have to really like put forth our knowledge when it comes to mm -hmm. situations like that. Yeah, it's important. All we're doing is informing and, and helping provide knowledge that we were we learned in school to now help the public in, learn how to engage more with children who are deaf and provide that education. So good that you're doing that. <laughs> All right, Miss Owen, Amy, it's your turn. You want to tell us a little bit about your experience? Sure. So um, like Ainsley just said, we're currently working together. But when we graduated, I actually went to Memphis um, and worked in an option school uh, working in the toddler classroom. So all of my students were two and just kind of in the midst of early intervention, which a lot of them were late identification. So very behind. Um, we collaborated a lot with TEIS, our Tennessee early intervention system. And so I had to document through there um, what kind of services we were providing all day to them. So the main focus in that setting um, was very, very just language enriched and a lot of thematic vocabulary to kind of catch them up of all those times and you know years that they missed when they weren't listening and I think what I liked about that setting was that you know with it being a private school you had a, li a little bit more um, freedom like a little bit more leniency as to how you address things and um, you were kind of I wouldn't say left alone, but they, because it is an, a listening and spoken language school, they knew that you were the, the um, expert there. So they didn't really, they just kind of said, do what you do. We hired you because we're confident in what you do. And so as far as, I guess, workload, as far as, you know, things like that and paperwork go, it was a little bit uh, less stressful, but um, I'd kind of thought about long-term, you know, future of what I was going to be doing and who needed help um, in the public school system as well as having making sure I have retirement and something like that for the long term and so I reached out to um, the public school system where Ainsley and I work now it's a really large school district in Memphis and they actually that year they had three teachers out of the five in their deaf ed program leaving and two of them are retiring one of them um, was moving out of state with her husband. So they were desperate and they were like, oh my goodness, we have a pre-K opening. Please, please, please come do this. We have all this state information and regulations and we don't have anyone to take care of this. So my first year I did the preschool program and that was really fun. And then, you know, we just kind of, sometimes we do like a fruit salad mix up just to kind of see what teams work together. So then the following year I taught a kindergarten first grade self-contained class. And um, then this year I actually had first, second and fourth, which was a little bit crazy because obviously those ages and those language levels and the, that academic content is a big divide compared to when you have one age where all your kids are a little bit more grouped by ability. So this year was a struggle for sure, um, making sure that we hit everybody's needs. Um, so right now it's looking like I'll probably be kindergarten first grade um, again next year. So I'm excited about that. And I'm glad that Ansley and I are working together because it does take a lot of collaboration. Um, I think one of the most important things is 
you know, we know a lot of information and, you know, these programs also know some information, but I think what's important to remember is things are constantly changing and um, evolving and things are getting updated. And so some things that we see are a little bit outdated or in the mindset of, well, we've always done it this way and it works, but we're trying to say, well, this is a little bit more efficient. This is best practice. This is evidence-based. This is probably a better option. So sometimes we have to advocate for things that may not be up to date or ways that we could address language. And like Ansley said, I think sometimes um, administration is so surprised because they're like, well, why can't these fourth graders read on a fourth grade level? And it takes a lot of education to explain. They miss the first four years of not listening at all. That is a huge gap that we're trying to make up and we're starting from way back here and you want us to jump here overnight. And so sometimes you're kind of considered the miracle worker, which can be stressful, um, but we just take it, you know, one day at a time and we do have a supportive team. We have an amazing team and good administration that supports us. Um, so I think it's a good environment and we're constantly learning. And I think hitting the language and making sure you advocate not only for your students, but making sure your parents are you know, knowledgeable about how to advocate is very important because most of them kind of just say, I trust you. Can you just, you know, I'll, I'll give you my child, like, please help them. And you get to the point where you kind of have to train them on what to ask for as well and, and what they should be looking for. Because like we know now in the, this whole pandemic is that the parents are having to kind of be the first teacher right now. And some of them are, are kind of rattling their brains on what to do. And so some of that is a little bit you're always training. So I think that's the main thing is we're constantly learning. Parents are constantly learning and hopefully our students are constantly learning, but it's been a really great experience. And I think it's good to kind of dive into different environments so that you're keeping, keeping on your toes and always learning something new. That's incredible. And uh, a good lesson for us all to know. And Ainsley, do you have something you want to add to that? Yeah, so Amy and I are at the same school, like we said, but a couple of things that I forgot to mention is that um, within our, we are the only housed program in our district, and our district has over 180 schools. Um, it's massive. Um, so we are the only one in Memphis, Tennessee, um, in a public setting. Um, also, we have an audiologist that comes by weekly to help us with issues. And I feel like that's a big part of where Amy and I, with our knowledge about um, devices comes in and um, we'll talk to them about troubleshooting, but they only come in once a week. Um, and I usually have a board on my, I have a space on my board that talks, has like audiology problems. So um, even though they only come once a week, we just kind of write them down. And then also we have one speech, we have two speech language pathologists this year that are dedicated, one's dedicated solely to deaf, uh, students who are deaf and hard of hearing, and then the other speech language pathologist kind of pulls our kids that are starting to um, go into general education setting. So we get really lucky with that because often we find in the field that speech language pathologists don't really know much about students who are deaf and hard of hearing, so this um, SLP does, and so that's been really cool to have too. Yeah, definitely. So um, I appreciate your perspectives and it's, it's interesting to hear how Ainsley came from one setting and then moved into another setting. And so as we go through, we're just going to hear all the different settings and we're all in different states. So um, let's go with Emily and you can tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and where you are. Yeah. Um, so I am still in my first job in Lake City, Colorado. It's the most remote city in the lower 48 states. We have 83 kids in our school from pre-K to 12th grade, and 5% have deaf, are deaf or hard of hearing. So it's a really high incidence. Um, so that's my primary job is working at the public school, and all grades are in the one building. So the culture is very unique and um, sometimes it's a little like too comfortable because we all know everyone's business. Um, but my other part of my job is I'm an itinerant as well. So I also work in the neighboring district and there are several schools over there. And um, I also have about four or five kids that I work with. So the model that I used to do 
was driving once a week and I would do that every week on a Wednesday and I would go team with their teachers, sometimes co-teach as well. And just a lot of training was being done on educating them, just like everyone has said already. I was the expert as well. They had never had a teacher of the deaf or hard of hearing before and had been searching for years. Um, so that was a big deal when I stepped into those shoes, but it was a lot of pressure as well. And it took a while to get a good system going to identify kids. Um, there's probably 20 kids total between my district and their district as well. Um, but to actually get that protocol in place, like the school nurse we had um, my first year was testing them at the adult um, hearing loss threshold there. So we weren't even testing them in the correct uh, decibel bracket to be identified. So that was a really big deal. And then getting that communication system to both parents and audiologists, that was also a system that had to be put in place and we finally have it. So that's really exciting. Um, and yeah, as far as, um, um, educating parents here too. It's been a really smooth process. A lot of the parents want to learn. They want the best for their kids. So that's been a really big deal too. And we also had had an administration change as well. But thankfully, the administrator we have now, she is um, the mother of my oldest student. So she gets it and she's a really big advocate too. So it's been nice getting to team with her. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of things were put on my plate as far as helping hire an educational audiologist and being in touch with all of that. Um, thankfully, with our training from grad school, I know how to fix FM systems and hearing aids. And so all of that information was what kind of spilled out of me unexpectedly. So um, yeah, it's been really fun and really enjoyable. And as far as my age range, I've worked with preschool to 12th grade, so the whole way through. Wow, that's incredible. And, and you were the first in that area to have any listening and spoken language experience or knowledge, right? Yes, yes. I was the first teacher of the deaf ever. So they've been trying to hire someone for a really long time. Um, but I will say that SLP who came up weekly as well. Um, she was very knowledgeable of deaf education and listening and spoken language. So um, even though she only came up once a week, she still had a pretty good foundation with a lot of the staff members and family and the students as well. So that was really helpful. Um, but definitely with me being in place and helping train and coach staff and families and just everybody <laughs> really. Yeah, having that um, consistency, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, thank you. Hillary, I know. How are you, Hillary? <laughs> good. Um, well, my, I, it's like, like just so cool to listen to everybody's like story. And I think all you guys are so like brave to like go and be the, you know, the first person that, that did, did this. And it's, I mean, we've already heard two stories of that. And that's like just so common. Um, when I graduated grad school, I knew I wanted a few things. I knew I wanted a self-contained class, which can be really few and far between if you're not in an option school for this. Um, that was the main thing. And I wanted to be with students on the younger side of the, the spectrum. And to find that in a public school, so like what Ainsley and Amy are doing is so rare. I mean, I would get like pages deep into district websites and then somehow discover that, oh, in Dallas, Texas, there happens to be um, a classroom that's a part of a public school, um, a public school being separate than an option school, which is like a, um, a network of these schools that all use listening and spoken language as their goal for their students. So anything that's in the option school network, that's their focus. There is some variety though in um, the students that they serve, but the main overall dream goal is that they serve students with listening and spoken language. Um, so there are some of those settings that are in the public school, but 
I found that they are very hard to find. And they also are really um, just impacted by the population of that specific year. So like that year, they may have, they may bus kids from four districts to make a kindergarten class that's housed in this building, but then the next year that's not there. So um, that was stressful. But through that, I never thought I was gonna stay in St. Louis, um, but I ended up staying. Um, only for the school that I work at. I work at an option school network school now. And I knew that if I stayed where I was, I would be a small fish in a big pool versus being the leader and knowing everything. And like some of my colleagues just really like stepped up to the plate. I felt like I wanted to be the low man on the totem pole first so that I could learn from the people around me. I didn't feel like I was um, ready to take on being the only one that knows everything. However, I doubt you ever feel like you're ready for that. And sometimes you just have to like, you know, this is it. Um, but anyways, I started off in the primary department teaching like first-ish grade. The next year I was still in the primary department, but working with kindergarten. And then for the past two years, I've moved down to the early childhood center, which is much more where my heart is. I loved all of my students, but my heart is in the beginning phases of language. I like to be the person that kind of shows families like their kid can do this, their kid can, can talk, is gonna do this. And you still have that when you work with the older students. Absolutely, it's just different. I had someone explain to me once that I was telling them that, that, you know, when you work with the younger kids, yeah, you're the person that turns on that their kid can talk, but for these older students, well, their, their parents never think they're going to read, or their parents might never think they're going to learn addition, and so you're the person that can show them, yeah, they can, they can learn addition, so it's different, and I loved that, but my heart has always been in the younger students. Um, so this year I've had a really interesting class because I'm still I'm in the early childhood center, but I also have a, a student who should be um, farther along. So my class this year ranged from four, a four year old to a six year old in our department typically ranges from like three to five. But as I think kind of everyone said, you have to be really flexible in this field and you group the students the best you can. Um, but my situation is a self-contained classroom. I have six students, which is actually the most, the biggest class in the whole school. Um, two of them are typically hearing peers, meaning that they have typical hearing and they act as kind of a peer model for my other students. I have um, students with bilateral implants. I have bimodal, two bimodal students. And three bimodal students, three bimodal, one with bilateral implants. And it's pretty amazing to see this year, four out of my six students are graduating and will go to a typically, tip their typical mainstream environment, which is awesome. Just to clarify, bimodal means that you use two different kinds of devices. In my students' case, they all have one hearing aid and one cochlear implant. So that's kind of my experience. It's been fun. And I love it. That's great. Thanks, Hillary, for sharing. It's um, yeah, it's amazing to hear all the different options and ways that families can go about finding education for their fam for their children who are deaf. So these are great just to point out what's available to families. So um, Kaylee, your turn. You want to tell us a little bit about what's going on in your world? Absolutely. Um, so following um, grad school, I tried to stay in St. Louis and I actually worked for um, a public school district where I say that I accidentally taught special education for a year. Um, I went for a child that had bilateral cochlear implants and high behaviors um, and then he actually wound up leaving the school. So um, I finished out my year and decided my heart was in deaf education and that I would move back closer with my family. Um, so then I, I made the trek out to Southern California and wound up taking a job um, in a large school district in Orange County, California. 
Um, when I first moved here, I realized there was a lot um, to learn about the state in general and how they um, handle special education. Um, the way that California handles it is we have what's called special education local plan areas or a SELPA. Um, so some school districts are big enough that it's worth them hiring their own professionals. Um, so the first place that I worked, I was there for two and a half years and I was hi hired as an itinerant teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, they were their own SELPA and so I served just that school district. Um, I served birth through 22 there. Um, and when I took the job, they did not tell me that I would also be doing early intervention. Um, so because the school districts are responsible for um, low incidence birth to three populations, that meant that I was doing it all, um, despite the job that I had signed up for. Um, and my only reason for the hesitation there is just because these birth to three kids they need a lot of support um, and that is definitely where I felt like the majority of my effort was going to um, just knowing the way that we were trained and knowing how 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 important um, birth to three is my job was to bring a lot of awareness to that for the school district um, and for the families because that was definitely um, foreign uh, knowledge for them. So I spent two and a half years pouring a lot of my energy into um, building them a birth to three program. Um, and then eventually I was feeling kind of tired um, and I was able to find somebody to take my place. Um, and then an opportunity showed up um, for a SELPA that um, we actually contract with five different school districts. Um, and so right now I'm servicing four of the five um, and I'm working from pre-K through eighth grade. Um, so that allowed me to kind of narrow my focus a little bit um, and feel like, you know, hey, maybe I can get really good at something. Um, and I feel like overall out here in California, my main focus has just been on bringing knowledge. Um, in grad school, we learn, you know, all the details of how best um, to teach these kids. And I find that the rest of um, the world, you know, kind of these smaller school districts. And um, I mean, I was definitely surprised coming from Missouri back to Southern California that, um, you know, these are fairly wealthy areas out here in Southern California. I thought, oh, you know, all these tax dollars, these kids are going to have good support. And what I found when I showed up was doesn't mean that you know that money is funneled where it needs to go or that people even know um, what to do in order to support these kids so at my first job I actually feel like I functioned a little bit more as an educational audiologist than I did a teacher of the deaf because um, I'm the one who managed for about 90 kids all the equipment that's out there um, and when you do that across like 22 different schools by yourself, you spend a lot of time troubleshooting um, and then trying to fit in, you know, like the early intervention services where you can. Um, so yeah, it's been really tricky. I'm glad to be on a really supportive team right now. Um, I feel like I've kind of found my people. They're out there, but also feel kind of guilty too for leaving where you started because, you know, that's definitely a hole too so but overall I've had a good experience but definitely do feel like my overall job is to preach equal access um, and I really feel like I'm successful when I lean back on um, reminding everybody that this is the law if you look at IDA if you look at ADA um, these are across the whole country and um, we're all responsible for making sure the kids get what the law says they should get so Yes, well said. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, it's, I think in all of our commonalities so far is that we're trying to group the children in order of what their need is. And, and we as teachers need to be able to focus in on that because we can't be spread across such a wide range and do our jobs proficiently. So in order to really um, provide 
the best support to the families and to the children. It's best for us to have that key group that we are able to educate and support. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's what we are, are here to do though and educate um, others and how we can best support and how they can get the best support that they, that they need. So yeah, um, Lydia Marie, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, so I'm Lydia Marie, and for two years straight out of graduation, I taught in a public school district in a um, rural part of Missouri. I was, like Emily, the first teacher of the deaf that that district had ever had. Um, so a lot of interesting things came with that. Um, I was basically building a program from the ground up, fresh out of grad school. Um, and my caseload was very, very small, um, but very, very varied. So I had one child who was a late ID. She was six years old and had almost no language. She was profoundly deaf and had just received her first cochlear implant. And then I had another child that was also a late ID, but had compensated really well through his moderate hearing loss. And so um, at the beginning of the year, I started in a more self-contained setting and then would occasionally venture to the other schools to see those other students. Um, but as the school year progressed, we noticed that that self-contained student, um, the goals that we had set for her at the beginning of the year weren't realistic. And so we reevaluated and I became more of um, an itinerant teacher who also pushed in and pulled out for private lessons in my room. So um, I kind of saw, I feel like the whole gamut there in terms of um, like setting. Um, so I taught there for two years and really loved my job, but then became a mother and found that I loved that job even more. <laughs> um, and so I was really fortunate. I was able to, at the end of the school year, my second school year, um, come home. And so now I'm a stay at home mom, uh, with my two year old son. And, um, but I still feel like even though I'm not working in the field right now, my son actually had, um, ear infections, like six consecutive ear infections for about three months from, I know Ainsley's son has experienced that as well. Um, so from 12 to 15 months, he just had back-to-back -back ear infections that we could not get under control and definitely experienced some degree of hearing loss because of that. Um, so we did get him uh, tubes and he did really well with that. And then the tubes ended up getting stuck in his ear canal and he um, experienced hearing loss from that. And because of the um, COVID-19 quarantines and stay-at-home orders, we couldn't get him into the ENT <laughs> for his post-op follow-ups. Um, and so we were just able to get him into the pediatrician where they removed his tubes last week. And I would say in the past week, he's just had this huge language explosion that has been so comforting to me as a mom, um, especially after you know, nearly a year of having kind of on again, off again, conductive hearing loss problems with your child. Um, but I feel like my, my background in deaf education and the training we was received at grad school was just so helpful during that time. Um, and of course it's, you know, it's hard to see your child not be where you know they should be, but also, you know, to be able to have the comfort, um, of that knowledge and be able to support them that way was really great. Yeah, that's something to celebrate. And how many words is he speaking in uh, sentences now? Um, so the other day he spontaneously produced a four word sentence and I just like, I know, I was so <laughs> excited. Um, I would say he's consistently doing two spontaneously, sometimes three of more familiar phrases. Um, He's also repeating me much more clearly and much more um, consistently, which is really encouraging because that's something we've been, you know, waiting on for a long yeah. time to happen. So, and that's all due to access to sound. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Incredible. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Stephanie, how are you? Tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. Hi. Um, I live in Arizona. 
Um, and I, like Hillary, work in a private option school for the deaf here. Um, and it is the only one in the state of Arizona. Um, so even, and even though I'm in this setting, it's quite interesting because um, unlike some, some places in the US, in Arizona, we don't necessarily get, um, or, or children don't get referred to our program right out, right out of um, the hospital. So they are usually funneled to an organization here called Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind, which has an oral program. It also has a sign-based program as well. Um, and also I believe it has some sort of total communication in the middle as well. Um, so all of our babies that are born um, get directed to Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind. Um, and sometimes it's great and sometimes they then come to us four years later without much language and so we have a, a large variety of kids and skill and skill levels at our school um in my school in particular we have i think it's five or six teachers of the deaf in pre in preschool um one toddler teacher and two speech language pathologists that work specifically with kids with hearing loss um so um, it's it's sort of it's an interesting sort of setup that we have going on. Um, specifically, I have um, been working with kids that range from three to five years old, but have higher language skills. Um, so they um, typically, after they are in my class, they graduate and they move on to either kindergarten or first grade, depending on where their age is. And I think the interesting thing about our field that a lot of even people in the education field beyond deaf education don't necessarily realize is that how we separate our kids is by language level and their skill levels. It's not by age per se. So my class can range from three years old to six year, years old, and in fact it has. Um, so what's very interesting is when I, I do most of my advocacy, um, I teach my kids self-advocacy because they all graduate after me for the most part. So we do an entire hearing unit, which I find very entertaining and they seem to like a lot because it's all about, it's about their experiences and sharing those things with new people. Um, but I also find that I do a lot of advocacy for them when um, we do transition meetings into public school settings. Um, even there, there are some school districts that are gung ho and ready to give all the services that we know our students need. And then there are some, um, districts that aren't. Um, so there's a lot of fighting that needs to go on from our perspective and from the parents' side as well that um, really make sure these kids get the services they need. And even if they graduate from our program with really good skills, um, advocating to keep those skills, those, those goals and targets for them once they leave is really helpful because we don't want them to then fall behind. Um, so that's a lot of where my advocacy work comes in and something that I've noticed also is recently with the whole pandemic and everything going on as, as well as a little bit before, um, a lot of my teaching also goes into parents, teaching them that they know their kids and they can help their kids and they know what their kids are capable of and they have the right and they have the power to advocate for their kids once they leave an, a program like mine. Or, or any program for that matter, um, whether or not they're in birth or early intervention where, this, where a lot of the focus is on parent goals, um, once they leave a private school for the deaf as well, parents are the, are the main advocate for their kids. Um, so they do have that, um, I guess, means of helping. Okay, thank you. Um, some something that came up was maybe to talk about a little bit of the structure of the day within the different programs and maybe how that's changed with COVID as well. So uh, maybe Ainsley and Amy, you can talk a little bit about your, your school before COVID and how you would have structured your day and then talk about what you're doing now. And either of you can kind of chime in. Um, hopefully y'all can hear me this time. I joined back on my phone. So if I was choppy last time, I apologize. Um, I would say that, you know, I, I know Ansley and I with working on the same team because we work with different age levels. It may be a little bit different as 
she was team teaching with one of our colleagues, which I know she could speak, you know, a little bit more on. Um, but my typical schedule um, is is similar to uh, the general education uh, schedule. They all have their support classes, art, PE, music, um, and we hit all of our academic subjects. Our our school and our district specifically have. Um, kind of like, I guess, not necessarily mandated by the state, but the district has their initiatives that they like to set in pla place to ensure success. So we're required to have a 45 minute intervention block where we work with, um, you know, lower level kids, which of course um, for our, our kids, uh, our whole day is intervention essentially. So we have certain blocks that we have to do in accordance with what our other teachers are doing in the building. And that ran really smoothly for the most part. I think the hardest part with, with us is when you have kids at different age levels that have ESL services for, you know, students that have second languages, you have children that have speech and language therapy, children that get pulled for OT services, occupational therapy. Um, you're working with all of these different teachers to have a schedule that runs smoothly while still maintaining all of their service hours. So you definitely have to be flexible. You definitely have to be organized. I know Ansley and her colleague are, are rock stars at that. So I always kind of follow their lead and get their input on my scheduling because it's definitely, it can be overwhelming at times trying to fit everything in in one day. But I know since COVID-19, um, it's definitely different. Our school, our district is very um, high poverty. I know that over 40% of our students um, don't have access to internet or technology or devices or anything like that. So virtual learning, especially for our summer school program, is supposed to be um, virtual as well. So a lot of our kids won't be receiving services that way either. So they're looking at ways to provide compensatory services during that time. Um, but right now our school, and not, not our district, but our school as a whole um, is requiring that we post at least um, or interact with a video conference at minimum three times a week. I know we all have our websites where I post uh, packets created by me based on what we're working on and their level. I, I try to create videos of games at home because so much of this is the parents or the teacher right now. So I don't want you to have to go to the store with these stay at home orders. If you have a deck of cards or if you have some dice or something like that, I can find a way for you to do math skills. Or if you have a book at home, I'll teach you how to do questioning strategies. So a lot of it has been more of that coaching model um, where you're really trying to get the parents to, um, you know, do what they can during all this craziness. I know a lot of our parents are just worried about getting food on the table and making sure that they're staying safe. And when you have multiple kids in one home and one device and they all have things that they need to do, um, I think a lot of our parents are worried about their kids getting even further behind. So it's going to be a catch up game after all this is over, but we're still providing supports throughout our regular school day, you know, eight to three, we're available for consult. Sometimes we schedule those meetings um, via video conference, phone, text message, whatever we need to do. Um, so I know Ansley's might be a little bit different, but that's what our school is requiring at this time during the pandemic. Nice. Thanks for sharing. Ainsley, do you have anything to add about how your um, particular classroom and your caseload has been structured before COVID-19 and now? Yeah, sorry. I um, was having network issues. So I got popped off a little bit. Okay. Um, but are you talking about like how what it's how it's set up now? Well, prior to pandemic, like how my yeah, like what your, what your day would have looked like, and, and Amy covered just a little bit about it, um, but maybe what, what you've done in particular to schedule out and how your students have um, been working throughout the day, and then how you're now structuring to help provide families while they're at home. Yeah, so um, it's, we always start now for next year. It's a big ordeal trying to get everybody's services accounted for. Um, where each student goes, all of that. Um, right now, like I said, I'm teaching fourth and fifth grade students. Um, next year, I'll be teaching second, third, and fifth grade um, within a self-contained setting. Um, I, we're actually doing a, a team teaching model with 
her name's Whitney. So Whitney and I, um, Whitney will do ELA and I will do math and science because that's always been um, my strongest subject to teach. So students, one grade level will come to me in the morning, I'll teach those students, and then the other half will go over across the hall for ELA, and then we'll switch classes. Um, it's kind of in and out. Some students are in general education for math, some aren't. Um, so these kids just kind of go in and out of our classrooms where they need to go. Um, that takes a lot of scheduling and preparation, um, lots of maneuvering, and then also working with the master schedule of the building. So it is something that's, that's hard to do, uh, but we make it work, but we have to be super prepared for that. Um, and also administrators have to be flexible, and then the general education teachers have to be flexible as well. So that's what my setting looks like. Now, for, um, now that we're in this pandemic, virtual learning. I've actually really enjoyed it. Um, only thing that kind of worries me is access to sound. I really wish my students had their FM systems because that's what they get in the classroom. Um, I saw on social media that I think it was Krista, she was passing out FM systems in California. I think she's still in California. Uh, so I hope that if we continue this like, long term that that's what they do because these kids really do need their FM systems. Um, so I'm meeting with them three times a week, like um, Amy said, and one day we'll do math, the next day, the, on Wednesday, we'll do reading, and then on Friday, we use that as a speech language opportunity, um, or we'll teach like a science lesson, but then also incorporate lots of speech and language, um, and that's set into their rules. Make sure you're always using good speech and language, um, and you're using all of your strategies for that, because these kids are older, they're able to remember, oh, I forgot. That's my experience with that. Yeah, and I just wanted to chime in um, because as an itinerant, um, that means that all of my students are either in a self-contained classroom or the majority of them are out in their general education classrooms. Um, and my biggest focus with all of the COVID-19 is, you know, it's wonderful that everything's been able to go um, digital but um, when these gen ed teachers have, you know, most of the times it's one child with hearing loss in their classroom, they're not necessarily thinking about access accessibility um, to sound. And so my job during this time has been doing a lot of um, awareness and then um, kind of working case by case to see how the kids are doing. Um, some of the older kids, I've been able to channel it more toward closed captioning. Um, and finding like what programs work with that, but um, closed captioning is only as good as your reading level is. Um, so that's kind of a challenge. And with everything happening just so quickly, um, all the FM systems are housed in each of the kids' gen ed classrooms. And so as the school shut down, um, that meant that accessibility to the FM system was also um, closed as well. So. Um, and then the way that we run it where I'm at is that the FM system is property of the school district. So there's kind of some lines um, that we're still trying to figure out on how we can get systems to kids. And then um, a lot of that requires like district approval and all of that good stuff too. So it's definitely been a challenge. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing right now as far as um, awareness for gen ed teachers that you mentioned? Um, my first line of defense through all of this was reaching out to all of the case managers and reminding people that um, a large portion of my job is um, to help support the staff in carrying out equal access. So just reminding people in the first place that um, for our kids, the biggest problem is access to sound. Um, and so as the platform changes, that's something, you know, to have a heads up about and that um, I'm here as a support to help them navigate that. Yeah, that's great. And Emily, are you doing something similar in working with your gen ed teachers and, and also working with families both and and all together? Yeah, I'm going through the COVID here. 
Um, I just want to kind of back up. We rent all of our FM systems from the Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. And I had worked something out with our special ed director, who's my other boss, um, to kind of make out a little form for checking out the equipment to go home um, and just kind of modeling and mirroring how we do it with technology. Um, all of the students in my district, both of them actually, they all get computers, which is a really big deal. So every student has a personal computer that they can take from school. And so we have a technology um, taking it home form in place already. So I modeled the same kind of form for the FM system. And that way students can take home the equipment for personal use and Actually, all my kids have them at home right now, so they are using it for their classes and it's within the home with their family, which is really great. And I'm super grateful for all the support I've had with my colleagues and my administrators to get that to work. Um, but yeah, as far as um, the main district that hired me, it's only a four-day school week. So on Mondays, I do pre-teaching. I have two boys that I do this for, and they get two hours each. One of that one of those hours is split with an SLP or auditory verbal therapist um, coming out of a program called Listen Foundation and that's out of Denver. And they always provide virtual therapy, that's their model. Um, so as far as transitioning into virtual teaching, all of my kids are used to that, which has been a huge blessing. It's, been a, it's made it a lot smoother, both for parents and for the kids, because the kids know how to do it, and so they're confident and capable of that. And we are also a Google school, and so we use Google Hangout for our classes, and it does provide closed captioning. Um, of course, it's only accurate if the speaker is enunciating and speaking clearly and at a good voice level. Um, just like we always try to train our colleagues to do for our kids. Um, but yeah, as far as what it looks like for my typical schedule, I'm also pushing in primarily for most of the classes. So I'm in AP Lit and Physics, sixth grade English. I mean, you name it, I'm in there. And I'm still doing that with these virtual classes as well. Um, one of my students has processing issues um, not related to deaf and hard of hearing. And so I use the chat room all the time. And if I know what the question is that the teacher is going to ask, I'll put that in the chat room. And that way my student can see it and read it before it's actually said. And he, he needs usually about a minute to process what the question is asking him. Um, so that's been one way of keeping those services and accommodations in place. And then, of course, modifying assignments is a big one, too. Um, so the most important thing that I advocate for is that they get at least one question for each content area you're expecting them to know. And that way, instead of like 20 questions, they get maybe 10, but they're still covering all the content that they're expected to know by the end of that unit. And that's been a really good way to modify the workload because it is a lot. And um, listening, like we all know, um, they get a lot of fatigue by the end of the day, and that's still in place now, even though we are virtual. Yeah, great. That's amazing that um, your kids have already had some access to virtual learning, and they're able to transition pretty easily, and they're still getting the services and FM systems. That's huge, huge to have those at home. Um, Stephanie and Hillary, do you want to share a little bit about what the option schools have been doing in your areas and like where you where you work and, and how you're providing services to your kids now? Typically, I um, have six kids um, and they're split into two groups of three um, and I have them for 30 minutes at a time. And while I have the three for 30 minutes, um, the other three are in our discovery room and then every 30 minutes they flip flop. So I teach um, because my kids are in preschool, I teach um, auditory skills, speech skills, um, language skills, both syntax structured language and then language experience, which is a less structured version to some extent where they start applying those skills we're working on structurally. Um, and we have a vocab 
experience story um, class later in the afternoon. And then because my kids are usually graduating um, and are about five years old, they have um, district IEPs. So they have an academics period for about an hour every day with me um, in which they're all there with me at the same time. So I have all six. Um, so that's sort of what my schedule looks like um, typically. Um, post slash during COVID, um, luckily we happened to be on spring break when the WHO announced a pandemic and we have two weeks spring break. So we were doing a lot of um, back end legal things our, administrat our administration was. So by the time we started two weeks later, we only had needed about a week or so for the teachers to, to kind of take our thoughts and put them into some sort of education format. Um, the biggest problem I'm coming across is my kids are all preschool age and they're just learning how to read, like they're learning their letters and their sounds. So um, ca closed captioning isn't really an option for my kids. Um, and they're also at a point where they're still busy bodies. They can only sit for 20, 30 minutes at a time. And even then we're running around and I'm doing a lot of things to help them stay focused in class. Um, so a big thing that we're having to work on or work around is behavior um, and getting the kids to sit long enough to even do class. Um, as uh, within the last couple of weeks, we sort of ramped up our quantity of services we're providing um, because up until that point, we weren't sure how long this was going to last. Um, so as of right now, we are required to provide 12 and a half hours of education for families a week. Um, Three-ish hours of those need to be like in direct um, virtual instruction in some form. But parents, if they aren't able to, don't necessarily have to take advantage. They just need to be able to have access to that education for their kids. So a lot of what I've been doing, which might actually be different from Hillary um, in her school, um, is because it's different for, for us from class to class based on our kids and their families and where and where we can meet them. Um, my kids um, are all on Google Classroom and we assign two to three activities a week through Google Classroom to parents um, that each cover a particular IEP goal on their kids' IEPs, whether it's auditory, language, speech, or academic goals. Um, that way we're still sort of working towards something. Um, and then I also provide an hour of parent coaching a week with each family separately. And then I have an hour and a half split up into three classes of direct instruction with my little groups of kids. And we do, um, one of them is a snack um, and show and tell where we do a lot more conversational language. One of them, um, we have our service dog come in and we do yoga with her for 15 minutes. Yay. And, um, and then do a lot of conversational stuff around that also. Um, and then our third one is more direct instruction where I actually work on auditory skills and speech skills, um, all, all of which basically require parents to be there in some capacity. Um, like Kaylee was saying, a big problem is, is access to sound virtually. Um, and beyond that, even access to audiologists uh, across the US and across the state, um, some audiologists are still in the booth and in the clinic doing work and some aren't. Um, so one of my kids actually just, her hearing aid broke last week, like her dog, I think chewed it up. Um, so it's been interesting because she's had a very rough week emotionally and hasn't been able to do a lot of the work assigned to her that she can do typically. Um, and I'm working with teaching her, talking to her parents about how a lot of that's probably due to the fact that she only can hear with one ear right now. Um, so trying to navigate those waters along with virtual learning is very interesting, but I would say a bulk of what I'm doing is um, parent coaching and teaching parents, not necessarily to do exactly what I do, but to realize that they have opportunities to help their kids all, all day if they just know to look for it. There I go. Yeah, um, go ahead, so Ellen. for me, for the a typical day, as I said, it's I have six kids. Um, but similar to what a few people have described, it's very in and out dependent on what the student's needs are. So in the beginning, the middle, 
first thing of the day is we have circle time. That's with the whole department. All together, it's a very typical preschool experience with like a calendar time and such. Then we have structured language or gym, and then it flops. And for example, my six kids are split and have three different teachers for language. So it's very, you're in a very, very small group. I at the right now happen to see two of my students one-on-one -on -one for two 30-minute sessions, but that changed throughout the year. In the beginning part of the year, I had two students and then one that was alone. Then we have, after that conversational language, which is all the kids together um, for a more kind of interactive conversational situation. Then we have centers, which is again, a really typical preschool experience where there's different areas that are focused on at each center. Like there might be something that's math related, something that's art related. We have in the afternoon, early lit, same thing. It's a small group. My six kids are split into three different early lit classes based off of their needs. And in the afternoon after that, we have speech and auditory training and then recess. I also additionally teach two of my kids, my oldest two math during that recess time period. Um, obviously we've been very impacted by the whole COVID situation. Similar to Amy and Ainsley, we're doing like a three day a week sessions. So basically what I do is on Sunday, I send home themed work because we, we go by themes and I've chosen to carry that over during this time period because I think it helps ground my kids learning in something. So I will send home a few things that the parents can do every day with their kids. This might be something like, here's a video to watch about spring and discuss with your child, or here's a scavenger hunt for a spring scavenger hunt to go on. Um, and these are all optional things to help give the parents directions. I've you know, there's, I know some families right now, their way of coping is, I can't really worry about this. I have to just like worry about getting food on the table and I don't know where to begin. But for a lot of them, it's, I want to do something. It's going to help me. Please give me direction. And that's kind of where my families are right now. So I'm of the mindset of, I'm going to send them stuff. And if they can't get to it, there's no pressure, but I would rather them have the stuff to do. So I send that in an email, but then in addition to that, I do virtual sessions three times a week. One of them is a group session with all my six kids, and then I see them each twice on the ends of that. So it's like the group sessions on Wednesday, and then sprinkled throughout there, I'll have the other ones. Um, just some like resources that I use, not only during this time, but pretty much all the time. A lot of them, most of them aren't specific to deaf education because we're a small field and there isn't very many resources that are tailored specifically for us, but Teachers Pay Teachers is a huge website that I use all the time. There's a free section on it. You can type in anything from middle F speech sounds to, um, you know, to addition or something and get free resources on that. So that's a huge one. I rely heavily on Pinterest, if nothing else, for ideas. So I might search something on there and then alter it um, to fit the needs of my students. So that just helps me, like, give me ideas. I've used both of those in terms of sending home work for parents. Uh, right now, specifically, there's so many resources out there, including, like, Scholastic and this, I think it's called Epic, E-P-I-C. Um, that have virtual books and virtual stories to do with your kids. So we're using Zoom and you're able to share your screen on Zoom and then you can do kind of an interactive story with your kids through that. So those are just some of the resources that um, I've been using not only now, but also during um, the whole school year. Wow, such a different view of everyone, what everyone's doing and um... I think the biggest thing that I'm taking away from this is that we have to have flexibility. We are advocates and we bring awareness to what families and other educators need for their children to make sure that the kids are getting the adequate and appropriate services so that they can have access to sound, so that they can learn language, and that it doesn't matter the age of the child, that what really we focus on is their language level. 
overall. Um, I'm just going to give a little background about Hawaii and what what's what I've learned so far here. Because um, I moved out here a month after graduation. I started with three weeks, three weeks of summer school. So we had ESY for um, eight children who are deaf here on Maui. And I had three or four, four of them were strictly ASL and a few of them were total communication and one was all um, listening and spoken language. So it was a huge mix within one classroom. I was the only teacher of the deaf with a couple of aides um, who knew some sign language but um, here on Maui, there currently is not any certified interpreters within the school district. So it's been a challenge to help at, give access to um, kids of all age range to even learn how to look at an interpreter and what to do with that. And um, many of the kids are being sent over to Oahu where the school for the deaf is because there's no deaf educator within the school system. So they were having to go for weeks at a time. So they are for one week, they would go on the Sunday night and come back Friday night. So they'd leave their families and go be at the dorm to learn and, and work all day within the school at the deaf. But that can't start until eight. So from birth to eight, kids are being serviced in a range of different settings where birth to three is maybe once every other week from an SLP, once a quarter from a deaf educator, and then three to five, depending on which island they're on, they may or may not get services at all. There's some public preschool options for them if they qualify. Um, there's some private preschool options where if they have a teacher of the deaf and the parents advocate for it and they know that their child needs it, then they can push to get their kids in there. But um, so far, it's just been like this challenge for me in stepping out of the Department of Education and the Department of Health is just bringing that awareness within um, legislation and helping um, provide typical general all over services for families. Sometimes we, I will meet with them and sometimes I just do like online and, and on the phone, just talking to them and just hearing their stories. and. Um, a lot of it is the understanding that they need to have their devices on all waking hours, um, being able to give them language in all, all activities that they're doing and what that looks like for them. Um, so I've been kind of wondering if there's any supports or ideas that you guys have that as teachers of the deaf, especially that we look we, you know, we, we, we need to use in the classroom and then we also need to provide for the families. So you guys mentioned a little bit, I know Hillary, you talked about um, what you've been using with giving support to your families, but is there um, like teachers pay teachers resources that you want to highlight and talk about for, um, for yourself and for your classrooms and for your families? Anybody you want to go first that you have an idea? All right, Kaylee, what do you, what do you use? Um, I think I do um, still rely heavily on a lot of um, CID or Central Institute for the Deaf's resources. Um, one of the curriculums that just came out recently was the early, it was for the early intervention population and it was really simple. Um, so I started to implement that at the very end of um, my stay with my first district, um, but I liked that because it was simple, attainable, and it was all about routines-based intervention. Um, but then as an itinerant, what I've really loved is just recently there's been a couple people producing um, Teachers Pay Teachers resources. Um, so I use, I think it's Listening Fun, um, has a lot of good stuff out there. And then another one, I think it's like Stressed Out Teacher. Um, but she's a DHH teacher as well. Um, and they've just been able to produce a lot of good stuff that I actually tend to write my IEP goals around. Um, because I, one thing we learned in grad school is don't reinvent the wheel. Um, so I certainly try not to do that. Um, but I use a lot of the um, like user guides and um, they've got a really 
a lot of really good stuff. You like, you know, stuff on where to sit in the classroom. Um, so there's different problem scenarios. So I found all of these to be good DHH resources. That's awesome. All right. Amy, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I definitely use a lot of those resources um, that Kaylee and Hillary have mentioned. I think one of the most important things and something that I've learned talking with parents during this whole pandemic is I think that um, they're, they're kind of stuck on, like, we're out of school. How, are, how am I going to get this school routine back? And to me, learning isn't just sitting at a table doing worksheets for seven hours a day. Like, we know that it's very interactive when you're younger. Um, it's very play-based, it's very language-based. So I tell my parents, you know, you're doing a lot more than you think as long as you are providing that rich language and, you know, reading to your child is just so important. That's something that anyone can do and you don't have to have a full library at home to do it. You know, you can pick something so easy. You don't have to have a printer and print out all these crazy crafts. It's all about your relationship, your ability to communicate with your child and just kind of narrate things and it's kind of one of those things we talked about in grad school of like if you've said a word enough to where it sounds annoying or you've said you you've said it a thousand times that's enough and so to me you can grab shaving cream and write words in it if you're not afraid of mess so it's things you have laying around the house and that's really what I've been trying to focus with my parents is that, you know, I can provide you all of these things that I would provide in class, but there, let me tell you about some things that you probably have in your bathroom that we can pull and work on math skills or one-to-one -one correspondence because learning is also in the home. You're your child's, you know, second teacher to us. So um, I think it's just important for them to also have confidence because although we're the experts and I would never expect my parents to know the detailed strategies that we know from school. But I think just hearing from some of my parents, I had an eight year old student um, who didn't know how to tie her shoes. And her mom called me yesterday saying, I know this really isn't academic, but she learned how to tie her shoes. And to me, that, that is a life skill, you know, that she, that you don't necessarily have time to talk about in school all the time. So it's not that just because we're not in this physical setting doesn't mean you're failing as a parent you know, you just got to do what you can and provide with what you have. And as long as you have that relationship with them during this time, I think, you know, they're going to be just fine. Thanks. Okay. Ainsley, do you have anything else you want to share about resources? Yeah, really quickly. I, I do use all the teacher pay teachers resources that um, Kaylee was saying and that Amy was saying. Um, for me, uh, I have older kids, I'm working with school curriculum, so a lot of mine is just modifying that curriculum. But as far as like teacher resources, a big, big community is on Instagram that I found. Um, so I have my own like teaching Instagram and I talk to teachers uh, of the deaf and hard of hearing quite frequently through that platform. And that's been really helpful as well. Yeah, that's great. It's great that we can come together. I think we are each other's best support system. So the more we as professionals can kind of talk about what's happening within our, our worlds and with our students, the better we will be as teachers. So I appreciate you all very much. It was nice to catch up with you. Um, we hopefully will do this again. Maybe we can just make this like a regular thing and just check in and see what everyone's doing this summer. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys.